Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to part two of my mod spotlight on Ender.io. Ender.io is a mod that adds a bunch of cool Ender-related technologies, including teleporters and the Ender.io block itself, to do all kinds of neat, cool stuff, such as the ability to remotely access blocks, and it also adds a very cool piping system, which we'll probably be getting into into today's episode. Uh, so let's get started taking a look at some of the machines we didn't get a chance to look at in part one. We'll also look at uh, the piping system and all that coolness. All right, guys, one of the blocks that I'm very excited about in this mod is actually something I was recently looking for in a mod. And then when I was working on the mod spotlight, I stumbled across it and was like, that's exactly what I want. Awesome. It's here. So let's place down a sterling generator, which, as we know, generates power using any kind of burnable substance. So let's throw some uh, blocks of coal in there, and it's generating 20 RF per tick, cooking along. What we can place down is this nifty block, the capacitor bank. This is uh, made with electrical steel and some double layer capacitors and some blocks of redstone. So not terribly cheap, but also not terribly expensive. Uh, this block acts as a battery. So you'll notice here that currently it has a max input and output of about 5,000 thousand RF per tick and it's starting to build up its little internal capacitor it can store a total of five million RF per tick sounds pretty cool uh, you can also you know input when uh, redstone mode output with redstone mode so you can disable the input and output uh, separately using redstone signals which is pretty cool and of course you can also configure the IO so that it can only accept from certain sides or output from certain sides or is disabled so for example if I wanted to make it so that it could only output from one side you'll notice that it's no longer building up power uh, also when disabled it's not building up power but when on input mode yeah, no problem, right? So pretty cool stuff all around. Um, now, what's really neat about these blocks, the capacitor banks, is they're multi-blocks. So you'll notice now that when I place this next one down, we now have a total of 10 million RF storage capable. Uh, and we can input and output 10,000 RF at a time uh, per tick. Now, this is the max of a resonant energy cell in thermal expansion. In thermal expansion, by default, there's no way to produce more or output more uh, RF per tick at a time. But with this mod, you can because this multi block structure can continue to form. So, two more blocks brings us up to 20,000 RF output per tick or input, and also uh, 20 million RF input and output. So, there's some new machines and a couple of the mods that I plan to use that do have some pretty high RF requirements, and I'm pretty excited to see that I might be able to meet those requirements by using a multi block capacitor bank. So, right now we have a total of 80 million RF potential storage, uh, and you'll notice here 80,000 RF pretty cool, right? So that is the capacitor bank. Pretty straightforward. Basically, uh, you know, you take your, um, you know, total RF, divide by a thousand, and you'll get the amount of input and output that you're allowed. And of course, you can change these numbers. So if you want to only be allowed to, you know, input, you know, five RF per tick, for example, you'll notice that we're now producing or, or pulling in about, you know, 200 every second or something like that. So it's, it's not quite the uh, crazy amount that you can get with uh, some other mod blocks, but I think overall, oh yeah, look at that. I don't think there's much else that you can uh, produce an input and output this much power with. Uh, but there are some mods that we have planned for the pack going in the future that might be producing large amounts of power for us. So, like I said, really glad to have this capacitor bank. Now, with the power monitor, which is the next set for this thing, this actually solves a problem that I've run into the past. If you watched my single player series, you'll have seen me create a computer craft uh, contraption to try and figure out how much power is going in and out of the system. Well, look no further than the power monitor. So right now, you'll notice that it's not working. I need to show you guys uh, some power conduits in a minute before I can actually show you this thing working. I don't think it'll work when simply sitting next to a block. It actually has to be connected to some power conduits. So why don't I give Give you a little sneak preview of some of the conduits so we're gonna grab uh, let's see ender energy conduit that sounds cool hook that guy in and you'll notice now because it's connected to a conduit it can read what's going on on this network and you can see average output over five seconds 80 RF per tick uh, that's because this machine right the uh, capacitor bank is pulling about 80 RF per tick and dumping it into the power monitor the power monitor uses a very small amount of power uh, and you can see now it's no longer really outputting power. Pretty cool. And internal machine buffers, 80,000 of 100,000. So overall, uh, all the machines on the network, it adds up their internal buffers. So for example, if we had a, another one of these Ender Energy Conduits and we had a SAG mill, for example, we would see now the machine buffers is 200,000. Okay, so it's, you know, 
building up a capacitor build up there. And let's make sure that this guy's outputting as much as he can. Oh, he's out of power, that's why. <laughs> so his internal buffer was out of power. Let's go ahead and throw a creative energy cell here to help speed this along. So now we'll see average output, you know, we're, we're outputting a lot more RF and it's gonna settle down once this thing fills up its internal capacitor as well. So overall, we can see both uh, overall conduit storage, uh, capacitor bank storage is that 80 million RF, total machine buffers, it'll add up all the internal buffers of all the machines. So this guy has 100,000 RF in his machine, this guy has 100,000, it'll add those up, and all the machines on your network. So you can quickly and at a glance see how much power is in all your machines and how much power is being used versus uh, input. So if we wanted to, we could connect this uh, creative energy cell to this conduit system. And then what we would see here is we'd see the average input over five seconds start to spike because now, uh, since we're measuring on this conduit line, we can see we're getting 20,000 RF per tick into the network, which pretty much makes sense with our creative energy cell, right? Not too shabby. And you'll notice now that once our machine buffers have started to uh, fill up completely, now we're only averaging about one RF per tick uh, output over five seconds. So what that means is the power monitor itself uses a very small amount of power, one RF per tick. So very cool way to monitor your storage network and see how much power is existing in your network and across all different points. The other nice thing to note about capacitor banks is they won't fill up until all the machines that need power fill up. So these things always are like kind of a, a lower priority than any other machine. So if I were to remove this, for example, and uh, let's get some capacitors, let's get one of those Octodic capacitors there. You'll notice that um, this thing will start to kind of fill up. Oh, you know what? This guy can't accept that much power. He can't accept as much as this thing's producing, so that's why it's not working. But just note, capacitor banks, lowest on the priority list. It'll always fill up machines before it'll fill up the capacitor bank. In this case, the sag mill can't accept that much power per tick, so it's just not. Now, if you don't want to have to use a machine to monitor this kind of thing, what you can use is this block, a conduit probe. Uh, this item, which requires a couple things here, should be able to tell you the current status of any energy network, and it can do some other stuff as well, which we'll see when we get more into the conduits. But if you right-click here, you'll notice that uh, it's able to show you the capacitor bank storage, machine buffers, and average input and output over time. So if I were to throw this in here and uh, go ahead and run this again, you'll notice the average input is around 36, and uh, hit that again, and it's at 100. Uh, we actually, I limited this thing, so we can bump it back up. And we'll see now that the average is climbing rapidly up to 20,000. Very cool. Now for a slightly less exciting block, but still cool nonetheless, reinforced obsidian. Uh, it's obsidian with a bunch of dark iron, so you're going to need some dark steel and some dark iron bars. Uh, this is nifty stuff because it's weatherproof. That's right, another way to trap the wither and prevent him from destroying the world. Not bad. So uh, not only is it weatherproof, it's pretty cool looking. Definitely looks like obsidian uh, reinforced with some of this iron stuff. Nice. Uh, it will take a little while to break through though, so keep that in mind. Next up, guys, is the Attractor Obelisk. This is a pretty neat block. It requires some solarium, some energetic alloys, an enticing crystal, which uh, requires a soul vial and an emerald in a soul binder, uh, which I'll show you in just a second, and the solarium, which is uh, soul sand and gold and an alloy smeltery. So probably not a terrible idea to show you the uh, soul binder while I'm at it, but we'll check that out in a sec. So the uh, block here, the Attractor Obelisk, is pretty cool. You'll note that it has a bunch of different slots for some of these soul vials. Uh, soul vials are crafted with fused quartz and solarium. Uh, this thing is pretty cool. Let's make it nighttime, and I'm going to grab myself a zombie. And just to be safe, I'm going to throw myself into creative mode so that the zombies aren't attracted to me for a minute, okay? Uh, when I place down a zombie, and let's make sure I'm also in not peaceful mode, Hello there. I'm going to capture the zombie in a soul vial, and you'll notice that I've uh, captured it. Um, I believe if I'm not in creative mode, let's see, soul vial. Yes, if I'm not in creative mode, it does capture the zombie. Uh, what I can do now is place the, uh, the, the zombie's soul inside the attractor obelisk. And what's cool is it'll attract any nearby zombies. Note that I'm still not in creative mode here, uh, but the zombie just can't help but be drawn towards this attractor. It doesn't pull him towards it, but it kind of encourages him to come towards uh, this thing. So if I place down a few more zombies, uh, you know, they'll start coming after me, but pretty quickly they'll start heading towards that attractor. Now it does have a limited range, so, you know, if they 
can't get too far away before they'll lose interest. Uh, but typically, they'll tend to be attracted towards it. Now, uh, because I captured zombies, it's only zombies that will be attracted. We're going to have to capture some other mobs if we want them to be attracted to it as well. Now, a similar block is the Aversion Obelisk. Now, this, instead of attracting mobs, will prevent mobs from spawning within its area of effect. So it's kind of similar um, to the Magnum Torch, if you will. Uh, it does require power, as you can see here, and it can also receive some upgrades just like uh, the Attractor can. So if we grab that Attractor Obelisk again, we'll note that it too can receive some upgrades, uh, which will boost up its range. So if we grab one of those Octocapacitor doohickeys, we'll see it bumps the range up to 64. Of course, using more RF per tick in the process and the same for this guy right if we were to uh, grab one of these octocapacitor guys right now range 48 boosts its range to 128 so that's a pretty good radius uh, to, to prevent mobs from spawning not too shabby and uh, you'll note of course that it's actually draining quite a lot of power to have that long of a range uh, and it looks like our hardened energy cell can't even keep up so more than 400 RF per tick it looks like uh, to handle a, a huge range like that but without that uh, capacitor in there plenty of power we have no problem filling this capacitor up pretty cool and if you hit the plus sign here, you'll be able to see the range in which it'll spawn. Oh, that's fancy. Cool. So this is the range at which it'll prevent mobs from spawning. Not too bad. I can handle that. Do note, of course, however, you're going to need those soul vials again. So remember I told you that you need some soul vials, so this one is a soul vial of a villager uh, to get your enticing crystal, uh, which is right now pretty much only used for the attractor obelisk as far as I know. Uh, but you can see here the soul binder, or, uh, soul binder, you can see there's a bunch of different things you can do with it. Uh, so with the, the soul binder isn't only used for making those enticing crystals, there's a few other things as well, like the ender crystal, which we saw earlier, requires an enderman soul, and uh, a zombie soul is used for the franken zombie. Haha, <laughs> that's cool. So a couple things that we can do with this soul binder. We're going to take a look at some of the other recipes that it's useful for in just a moment. Now we've all stumbled upon some kind of uh, monster spawners in the world, be it skeletons or zombies most often. Uh, when you break them with this mod installed, you'll get a broken spawner from Ender.io. You'll notice here that it tells you to combine it with a powered spawner in an anvil uh, to set the spawn type. Let's take a look at what's involved. Uh, one thing that you can do, uh, aside from doing that, is also to get yourself uh, one of those nifty little soul vials. Let's say we want to change the type of spawner. Let's go ahead and uh, make sure we're not in peaceful mode. And let's say I wanted this to be an Enderman spawner, just because, you know, Enderman. Uh, let's go ahead and grab that, and then we can yoink, steal his soul, pop him in here, and... You'll notice that it's going to require 15 levels of experience. Now you can either pipe this experience in uh, via liquid EXP or you can use the player's experience. Let's try piping it in. So you'll notice that I quickly used open blocks to drain some of my experience into liquid experience. Neat. Let's see what happens when we try and pipe it in here. I'm going to use the liquid transfer node just because I haven't really shown you guys conduits yet uh, from extra utilities. Boom. Cool. You'll notice that it's draining in there, and if we take a look, we'll see that we've fulfilled two out of the 15 experience requirements. Awesome. Now, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and also just uh, fill this up with the XP. So let's get some uh, potions. There we go. That looks like enough. And we can use the player's experience there, and you'll see it starts processing. Go, Soulbinder, go. Do keep in mind, however, this is a really long process, and it's probably using a ton of power. A really long time. And a really lot of power because we drained our hardened energy cell. Alright, looks like it's finally done. Hey look, a broken spawner of Enderman. Nice. So that took a lot of power, but now we've got a broken spawner. Now all I have to do is combine it with a powered spawner as indicated on the tooltip. So, powered spawner. There we go. Not a terribly hard machine to make, but you do need some of those vibrant crystals and zombie controllers and some kind of uh, monster head. Uh, simply combine these two things. So, one here and the powered spawner there. There we go. Enchantment costs 30. Jiminy Jillikers. Let's try that again. Uh, powered spawner and broken spawner equals... Ah, neat. Powered spawner of Enderman. Supply with power to activate. Upgrade with capacitors to increase speed and energy storage. Nice. Let's just make sure. Oh boy, Enderman. How's it going? I don't think I want to upgrade these with capacitors at all. Alright, let's try it. Nice. So as you can see, a very cool way to generate lots of mobs. Uh, the powered spawner is definitely cool. Ah, they're everywhere. Everywhere! 
we should do something about this. Let's get Killer Joe. Uh, just need a Franken Zombie and some Fused Quartz and Dark Steel. This guy, when uh, given some nutrient, one and two, sure, why not? Uh, you'll notice here that you also have to give him some kind of sword. So let's give him a diamond sword. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, he should be able to attack any mobs. Oh, there we go. He definitely started hitting some Endermen. Nice. He'll attack any mobs nearby and try and eliminate them for us. Thanks, Killer Joe. Very cool. You can uh, pipe liquids in and out, and you'll also notice that he has a little bit of an internal experience bar, and he will wind up using uh, the sword of it. Hey, nice. Good job. Um, he'll start collecting a little bit of experience for you. He'll kill any mobs nearby. And you can collect the experience uh, by taking it with the buttons, or you can pipe it out using any kind of liquid conduit piping system. Um, Ender.io has its own version of liquid experience, but if it detects, I think, open blocks being installed, it'll use that one. Cool. All right, let's take a look at some lighting options in Ender.io. You have a couple different options. You can go with lights or powered lights. Now, normal lights, um, which you can make with uh, just a little bit of uh, any kind of glass almost and some glowstone and some iron, are neat because they can be placed kind of anywhere, and they're really small. Uh, so you'll note here that they really kind of are neat. Uh, you can just break them with a pick to get them uh, to fall down and come back to you. Uh, they can go on the roof or they can go anywhere, and it's basically like a torch light, right? So same kind of radius that you would normally get from a torch. Cool. Uh, now, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and get yourself a powered light. Now, this thing is going to require a bit of RF, so let's put a creative energy cell nearby. Uh, let's just put it here, for example. There we go. Neat. It doesn't have a UI, but you'll notice that, oh, wow, it's really lighting up a bigger area. So the powered light, while requiring power, um, is going to light up a big, large area for you. Neat. And there's definitely some ways to hook up some power to this to make it very hard to notice, and I'll show you that in just a bit when we get to conduits, which I keep teasing, apparently, because uh, they're really cool. So the powered light uh, requires uh, a powered light here. You'll see it's a little bit of basic capacitor, a little bit of glowstone and some silicon. Lights up a larger area, requires power. So speaking of some of the types of glass, uh, we've got fused quartz, which is blast resistant. You'll notice here it's just some nether quartz uh, inside an alloy smeltery. Pretty cool. And when placed in the world, it has some pretty nice connected textures going on. Nifty. Uh, we've also got quite clear glass, which is just sand in one of those alloy smelteries. Uh, you'll notice here that it is, in fact, quite clear. It looks pretty much the same as the fused quartz, uh, except that it's easier to make, obviously. It's sand instead of nether quartz, uh, but it's not blast resistant. And then finally, you've got enlightened clear glass, which is pretty cool stuff. Um, it's clear glass that emits light. So if we placed some clear glass around here, you'll notice very quickly that it's emitting light. And you'll notice also that it uh, connected textures with the non-light and clear glass. So if you want to have, you know, one enlightened clear glass surrounded by a bunch of quite clear glass, you can do that, and it's obviously a lot cheaper. Nifty. And when you break it, of course, you get it back, which is always kind of nice. So reservoirs are pretty neat. Uh, you'll notice that these are uh, formed when placed in a two by two by one pattern, and then you need to add two buckets of water for an infinite water source. Neat. So just one, two, three, four, and then boom, it automatically forms into the multi-block structure. We get ourselves a couple buckets of water and one two, and ta-da, all of a sudden, infinite water source. Very nice. So just a nifty uh, little way to make sure you always have infinite water. Uh, helps to prevent the problems that sometimes happen when you're creating an infinite pool in world. Sometimes, you know, that can kind of break when chunks load or unload. Here's a nifty gadget that shouldn't need too much explanation, the electromagnet. Throw it and boom, any items dropped on the ground will start flying towards the player. Cool, right? So there we go. Yoink. Sucks right into your inventory. It is powered by RF. And when your electromagnet or any RF device, for that matter, is low on power, go ahead and set yourself up with a wireless charger. Boom. Check it out. It's filling up my electromagnet for me. Thanks, wireless charger. Very cool. No interface, no upgrades, just place it down and it'll fill it up. The uh, electric charger here, as you can see, uh, just charges nearby items and players' inventories. So it'll charge it pretty much anything that accepts RF power even including some items like the flux-infused sword, uh, as long as you actually give it power. There we go. Flux-infused sword from other mods, definitely charging up. Sweet. The experience rod is a way to store experience in tanks. Uh, basically, if I shift right click, it'll store experience in the tank, and right click to pull experience out of the tank and back onto the player. Very cool. Nice. 
So you can see here, uh, pretty nifty way to store in a, pretty much in any uh, liquid tank at all available in the game. Uh, you can just store your experience. Similar to other mods functionality, but of course, you know, very useful if you don't have a mod that allows for experience storage. And also a nice quick way to transfer it into the tank or remove it. Speaking of tanks, this mod definitely adds a couple. So some glass, iron, and such gets you just a regular old fluid tank. Uh, you can just pipe liquids in and out as normal. And you can, of course, uh, also pick it up while it's got liquid in there. Uh, I don't know if you need to use the wrench or not. Let's try it. Yeah, there we go. Cool. And you'll notice it retains its water. Uh, another option is the pressurized fluid tank. Uh, this guy is blast resistant. Very nice. Now what's cool about the pressurized fluid tank is it can actually be used uh, to fill up uh, liquids. So you can see here, it's got a total storage of about 32 buckets worth, and you can place a bucket full of water or something like that in there, and it'll go ahead and fill it up, place an empty bucket here, and it'll fill it up with the water. Neat. And also redstone mode active, and you can configure the sides to uh, you know push or pull liquids, or both. Another nifty block is the Experience Obelisk, requiring an Experience Rod. This is the block version of the Experience Rod. You don't need to keep an Experience Rod in your inventory at all times. Uh, you'll notice here that if you shift right click, it'll go ahead and take whatever experience you have and store it in the adjacent tank, uh, and right click to get your experience levels back one at a time. Next up, we've got the Enchanter here. Uh, what you can do is combine a book and quill with certain items to get certain uh, enchanted books. Now, it is going to cost some experience to do this, so there's uh, a, an experience cost when you get the enchanted book, and of course when you do some other stuff as well, and the enchantment cost uh, scales. So, for example, if you wanted thorns, you need to find a rose bush. If you wanted aqua affinity, you'll need a lily pad. Pretty neat. Uh, feather will give you feather falling, and gunpowder will give you blast protection. Let's go ahead and get some fire protection on this book. I'll kind of throw it in there. Enchantment cost, six. Okay. Let's get 50 levels worth of experience for testing purposes. Fire protection, one. Cool. Uh, not too shabby. Now, you'll also notice here that if we were to grab that book and quill, and we could put three blaze powder in there to get fire protection, three, four blaze powder to get fire protection, four, and that's about the limit. Okay, so you can't get any more than what you would be able to get from vanilla. It's obviously a higher cost um, to get these books. And keep in mind, whereas you would normally be able to enchant uh, something with multiple enchants, like you could get three or four enchants out of 30 levels, this one you're only getting one enchant uh, for 36 levels. So definitely a steep cost, but it allows you to pick what enchant you get, which is always kind of nice. All right, guys, next up is the farming station. Uh, as you'll see here, uh, this guy requires a uh, diamond hoe, some machine chases, a pulsating crystal, which is a diamond surrounded by some of these pulsating iron nuggets. Uh, let's take a look at what's involved here. I've already configured it a little bit, uh, and you'll notice that it's automatically planting a bunch of stuff for us. Sweet. So we planted some wheat here, we planted some uh, mandrakes from witchery, and we placed down some oak saplings. Awesome. Uh, you'll note that you just place the particular types of seeds or whatever you want to be in the different slots. We should be able to, of course, also throw uh, potatoes in there. And, yep, no problem planting potatoes for us. Cool. Uh, we can also get ourselves a capacitor if we want to bump up the range. And, of course, uh, the required power output. Yep, definitely much larger range there. So you're going to want to go ahead and uh, automate piping items in here just to make sure. Pretty cool. You'll notice all the different uh, stuff nearby still doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it'll also tell you when it's out of seeds. Cool. So uh, this farming station will also harvest for you. Of course, that's going to require the use of your diamond axe. So if we were to, for example, bone meal some trees, we should see it quickly start to harvest for you anything nearby. And we'll do some potatoes as well. Oh, there we go. Tree's already gone. Got us some uh, wood and some apples and placed the oak saplings right back in here. Cool. Looking pretty good. Oh, there go the potatoes. And uh, they're stuck right back into there for us. Very cool. And then planted, of course. So uh, the farming station, just a nice automated way to do some farming. Does require power and, of course, requires more power. Right now it's using 93 RF per tick. If we didn't have the octic capacitor in there, it would be 40 RF per tick. Next up. Dark pressure plate. Just requires some dark steel. What this is is a player-only activated pressure plate. Uh, while that's all well and cool, only players can activate it. No items, no mobs, nothing else. Only players will be able to activate this pressure plate. There's some other neat stuff we can do with it. For example, we should be able to uh, bring it over here to the painting machine and maybe paint it to look like dirt. Sure, why not? Dun-dun-dun-dun. 
Sweet. Now it's a pressure plate that looks like dirt. <laughs> How cool is that, huh? Um, so obviously some nifty stuff you can do. If you want it to be invisible, I believe it'll tell you on the tooltip, paint it with some quite clear glass. So grab some of this stuff and we'll just kind of do that. Did I grab the wrong thing? All right, looks like I have a bug to report. I can't get the quite clear glass in there, but just take my word for it. It would be invisible. Uh, you can also get yourself a um, silent version of this pressure plate. So let's see here. Uh, you'll see the silent one just requires some wool underneath and that won't make a sound when you step on it. Cool. Speaking of being able to paint things, uh, let me show you another feature of the painter. And believe me, this isn't the last one. Uh, you can paint glowstone. Dun, dun, dun. So we can have uh, some glowstone here that looks like pretty much anything you want. So if you'd like to decorate your house with dirt, no problem. There's dirt that gives off the same light level as glowstone. Cool. And you can pick it up with a pick, no problem. So if you're like me and like to use some stone bricks, so let's get ourselves uh, just some regular old stone bricks here and another piece of glowstone. You know, I can have uh, my 9x9 nine nine made up of all stone bricks and then one of them can be a piece of glowstone on the floor or something and you would never be able to tell. Ta-da! the difference between the stone brick that is glowstone and the one that's not. How cool is that? All right, guys, I think that's a good wrapping up point for the episode. We haven't quite hit the, the, the normal 30 minutes that a mod spotlight would be. Uh, however, I have a lot to cover with the conduit system. Believe me, there's a ton of stuff to check out here, uh, and I don't think I can cover it in the remaining time. So what we'll do is we'll wrap up here, and we'll come back with part three of the Ender IO spotlight. For now, hope you guys enjoyed part two of Ender IO. Lots of cool gadgets, and believe me, the conduit system is very cool and very fun to use, so I can't wait to show it to you guys in part three. I was hoping to get to it but there's just so much stuff in this mod that i really didn't get a chance all right guys for now direwolf 20 signing off take it easy